Hello and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. Um, we're really lucky today to have Brandon with us, who's going to, Brandon Sparks is going to talk about um, in cells. Um, he's a lecturer at Kingston University researching sexual offending, healthy relationship and the subject of in cells. Um, so welcome Brandon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, and could you tell us a bit about your route into forensic psychology? It dates back quite a ways um, in terms of basically I thought at the time uh, I wanted to do clinical psychology and I was applying different places. Always kind of had a general interest in forensic psychology, but wasn't necessarily just applying for that. Ended up getting into a non-clinical program with a, a forensic supervisor and basically just never looked back. Uh, so it sort of stumbled my way into something that ended up working out. So. I think nine out of ten people tell us that <laughs> they didn't need to be forensic psychologists, they fell into it. <laughs> yeah. But also that they're very happy in being them. <laughs> um, Brandon, you gave a fascinating presentation at the DFP meeting last year. I, did, I don't think there was anyone that wasn't talking about how wonderful your presentation was. So you sparked a lot of converse, conversation. Um, you, so you, you spoke about incels. Could you first start off by telling us what an incel is? What does it mean? That's a lot of flattery. Uh, so this is actually something, so defining an incel is quite uh, difficult in a way. Uh, and I'm actually conducting uh, some qualitative interviews with Within, within cells, <laughs> and I spoke to a few today, and one of the first questions I always ask is, what is an incel? And everyone gives me a slightly different answer. Um, so if we wanna take a broad approach, we can say it's generally refers to an individual who is not engaged in any kind of romantic or sexual uh, relations with somebody, despite really wanting to do it. Uh, so, you know, they're sort of in in, in a long term, uh, an involuntary celibate. Uh, and some will say I'm an involuntary celibate, but I'm not an incel because possibly to them, incel comes with a bit more baggage. Um, and, you know, we've certainly seen in the news this idea that, well, incels are also misogynistic and, and or violent and or hold uh, particular ideologies and it really seems to depend on who you ask, whether or not that's sort of part of the, the entry requirements into the incel club, uh, or whether it's just kind of the the circumstance one finds oneself in. Because you'd almost think you'd have to have the um, other aspects, the misogyny and the views of women to make it a problem because some people are involuntary celibate and that's not a problem or it is a problem to them, but they're not causing an issue to anybody else. So I guess where's the line then of them? Because, or how do they see whether they're an incel or not? Yeah, and it's something that I think some of them have difficulty navigating because they say, well, this is sort of a community that can understand again, the circumstance that I'm in and the plight that I feel and they're not going to minimize it. Um, but then they also kind of feel like, well, do I really fully belong here? Uh, would they be as accepting if they knew that I didn't really hold all of these ideologies? Um, and it seems like a large member are feeling that way. And, you know, and maybe they make up the majority, maybe the majority of them don't really hold some of these attitudes or at least fully endorse them uh, to the extent that some people May assume uh, but then no one really wants to go up and necessarily say that because they might be ostracized or, or criticized or something like that by a more you know more vocal minority or something like that so is there a sense that there are a group of people that haven't got other friends and so that they want to be in this community for the sake of the that comradeship or friendship rather than necessarily holding their views do you think yeah, I think that's one of the biggest parts is this is a group of individuals who get what I've been going through. Um, and, you know, a, a, a number of incels I've spoken to over the past few weeks have indicated, you know, it's it's they can wade through or ignore some of the more maybe hostile or negative stuff. Uh, and they use it as opportunities to learn about themselves. Uh, reflection and again it kind of boils down to this is serving a a positive function 
for them to be involved um, in these communities, even if they're not posting themselves, even just reading other people's posts, knowing that it's not just them uh, experiencing involuntary celibacy um, and an opportunity to uh, reflect uh, or, or again, just, just feel less alone. That's really interesting. So it seems almost like um, radicalization of some sort then that people can be drawn into something and then it's encouraged by the community of people, particularly when it's online, that they, they're mixing with, as it were. Well, and I think that's where people get a little concerned because you basically have some of the only outlets that these individuals have to talk about these issues um, are ones that ho have some of this you know, less helpful, I'll call it, uh, content. Um, so obviously, if you get repeatedly exposed to it, um, you know, that's concerning. Um, many of the individuals I've spoken with say they just try to ignore it. Um, maybe there's certain threads or whatever that they just choose to ignore completely. Um, but, you know, they they have to go through that filtering process, right? And I'm sure before they realize that they have to do that, they, they've read some of the stuff, but for whatever reason for them, it didn't really resonate. I recently watched, uh, there was a Channel 4 documentary um, about incels, and it, it was quite provocative. You know, I just finished watching it about 20 minutes ago. I did it while I was, while I was cooking, watched it while I was cooking. Um, and I mean, there's certainly a sensationalist element to it. Um, I do think some of the individuals involved in, in the production of that were, were trying to come from the right place. Uh, I think they were genuinely concerned about um, the well-being of some of these individuals. But yeah, that kind of element was a bit glossed over, sort of like the, the why are they there in the first place? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've seen people kind of blame themselves and say, okay, well, if you don't endorse the ideology, why do you still hang out in these groups? Um, not really recognizing that it's there for many of them, it's the only kind of safe place where they can discuss these things and not feel judged um, and not feel like what they're going through is minimized. Um, you know, a, a number of incels have told me like it's quite validating going on there and basically seeing people write stories about things they've experienced and going like, wow, this is, this is exactly what I've experienced as well. Um, I'm not alone in this. Um, and yeah, just the, the sort of self-hatred, I think, again, didn't get captured. Um, you know, in my own research, I've been found that, you know, rates of depressive and anxious symptoms have been like, much, much higher than it is for for just non-incel men, um, self-esteem, relationship contingent self-esteem, all those kind of metrics of well-being are just not very good. Um, and, you know, there seems to be higher rates of things like suicidal ideation, um, you know, and, and, and someone told me today that, you know, like incels aren't really violent and if they are violent, they're violent towards themselves. Um, and and they're kind of like the biggest risk is the risk to themselves because of how they're feeling. And maybe for a small number, that self-hatred reaches a boiling point when they then it, it becomes outward, right? And it's, it's held toward women or society or something like that. But I think most of them really direct that inward. And there's a lot of a lot of self-hatred, a lot of embarrassment. And if they don't have an outlet uh, or or a forum where they can express that uh, and they feel shame to talk to, if they do have some friends or they feel shame to talk to their family about it, I mean, what what do you expect? 
I mean, it seemed to come to light following the actions of um, Elliot Lodger, who's an American who killed, when I mean, he made a video of himself saying he was going to go into a sorority house didn't he, and, and kill these blonde, fem beautiful females that were there. Um, and then for some reason he wasn't able to get into the house. And so he killed six women, just random women, and then killed himself. And he's sort of seen on these um, forums as being a hero and sort of people, to, someone to look up to. And I don't know that that really sort of came to public awareness necessarily in this country, more t until um, in 2021 when um, in Cornwall a similar thing happened. Jake Davison killed five people, including his mother. Um, but he he sort of preached on an incel forum of his hatred of women um, and fascination with guns. Um, so, you know, that, I think that came more in the UK then to hear about it as a uh, as a entity, as it were. Yeah. And, you know, people have asked incels, you know, like, do you actually support or endorse um, Elliot and, and some of the others that have engaged in that kind of behavior? And, you know, the large majority don't. Um, but, you know, again, you hear more about the um you know the, again the, those vocal minority that might just be trying to stir the pot um you know a number of incels have indicated that they they use the forums but they don't really post in them so there's a lot of people basically lurking mm -hmm. um that aren't really captured when you look at these mm -hmm. um you know analyses of forum posts or something like that so those individuals might differ from from those that aren't are and aren't posting so yeah, I, I again, you you do see some posts that seem to praise uh, or glorify some of these attacks, but uh, a lot of them don't really like that, and a lot of them see these individuals or individuals who praise it as making it even harder to be an incel because you know there there probably wasn't nearly as much stigma around that um, prior to some of these violent attacks. There might have been a little bit of stigma because, you know, as a society, there is kind of an expectation that you reach a certain age and you've probably had some sort of uh, romantic or sexual experience and, you know, not like non-incels uh, that are still, you know, virgins through emerging adulthood have indicated that as well, right? That, um, you know, there is kind of a shame just embedded with not meeting those kind of cultural milestones or something um and that it can at some point become embarrassing to talk about uh, or acknowledge uh, but now incels have to deal with that and the baggage that comes with the label in your research has anything else come to light that makes someone more prone to using violence and turning that self-hatred outwards i don't know so like that's almost i guess I don't want to say anecdotal, but I mean, you know, in terms of like you can conceptually understand that someone could only direct so much hatred inward before they either, um, you know, for incels sake, um, either attempt or suicide or direct that outward. Like everyone's got a limit. Um, and that limit might just be something like, you know, getting a bit irritated with, you know, your spouse or your child when you're, you know, already very stressed or something like that to more uh extreme examples um so yeah i don't really know of a ton of like a huge body of literature to really um go back to on that some of the men who were featured because there was two programs on sort of roughly the same time um and i'm so i'm not sure which one it was on but they were sort of very um angry about not having any friends but they blamed it on females rather than males and and they were you know one of the men was saying i haven't got i never go out i've got no friends i don't go anywhere i'm very isolated um but blamed that on females rather than him, himself of not going out or or males not being available <laughs> to be friends with so it's interesting how it sort of gets turned into it's um it's the fault of females that they're in that position rather than thinking any other reason that people have for not getting into sexual relationships or intimate relationships of any sort well again like you see i found that you know incels tend to be higher in 
like relationship contingent self-esteem, right? So this idea that your steam, your your self-worth basically is dictated by your relationship status. Um, and obviously if you feel that way and you're not romantically successful, um, it might it might be a logical conclusion to blame women. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right thing to do, but I understand where they where that logic may lie. And I wonder perhaps if they're basically saying, well, then women are the reason for my low self-esteem. Ergo, I don't feel like I've got the confidence to go out and and make friends. Um, again, this is this gets to be so idiosyncratic because it's such a, a diverse group. Number of the incels that I've spoken with don't really blame women at all. Um, they may endorse some elements that we see throughout kind of the incel community, but they don't see women as the villains. And obviously others, others do. So what made you go into this research in the first place? What made you spark this interest? I'm trying to like fully remember because I, I knew that incels existed, um, but something came about in probably late 2018 where I wondered, well, what's the research say about this group? Right? Because I, I, I don't know if they were just coming up more in the news or, or what. And when I looked, there was nothing. Um, apparently the term incel also refers to some weird thing in biology. So if you search incel in Google Scholar back then, everything that would come up would be like this, this strange chemistry paper. Um, so I thought, well, you know, that's kind of a shame that we don't really have any actual research on this group. And we're basically just relying on, you know, news reports or whatever. So I put together uh, a study just to kind of address that, thought it might be cool um, to be one of the first people to, to do it. Uh, so it was basically purely academic curiosity. Um, and I did feel a little bad. Um, you know, I, I can't fully imagine what it would feel like to experience both romantic and broader social rejection over a prolonged period of time, right? Like, I think most people would, would be openly admit that, yeah, going through life with with no significant other or friends uh, and living a fairly lonely existence when you are seeking that and when you really want that would be something that we wouldn't really wish on anybody. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to forward the, forward the research and hope that we could have maybe a bit more of an informed and sober-minded uh, discussion about incels. I was reading about how now there's such a thing as a, and I might get the term wrong here, as a fem cell. That is, is there a limited amount of research on that too? I don't believe there's any research on fem cells. Um, certainly something I'm, I'm interested in, in learning a bit more about. Um, and yeah, they did feature a, a fem cell on the, the Channel 4 uh, documentary. Um, Yeah, and I think one of the reasons we see the the, the term fem cell come about is there are incels that believe that uh, that is a male only domain, uh, that women can't be incels. So I think women have sort of come up with their own term um, to, to capture that. Mm. But I don't know if they have any special ideologies or or anything like that. Um, it's worth noting that the original term incel, if we go back 20 years, um, was was gender neutral, right? And there were incel forums that allowed anybody, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of their their gender, to, to to take part and to discuss these very same issues um, in terms of you know I'm getting a little bit older and you know, either my friends or my, maybe my siblings, or at least, you know, people I went to school with are all kind of moving on with their life. They're engaging in, you know, relationships, they're having kids, or they're like really living it up in college or something like that. Uh, and I'm not. And 
you know, if you kind of continue to miss some of these milestones, it makes it's probably quite difficult to bounce back and maybe relate to your peers, mm-hmm. right? If all your, I don't know, even your, if you have coworkers and they're all similar age, but they all have kids at home. And meanwhile, you've never kissed a girl. Um, they might be talking about like parenthood and marriage and whatnot. And how do you relate to that? How fascinating that it used to be a gender neutral term and then it's became male dominated. Yeah. Yeah, it got a bit co-opted. And do you know how or why that happened? It's kind of fuzzy. I don't fully know. Essentially, the person, Alana, who started the forum, uh, so it was started by a woman first uh, from from Ontario. Um, She eventually basically found herself to be a little bit more successful as she got older. so others started to moderate. And as you can imagine, even probably in the early days of the forum, I'm sure there were some people posting some uh, not so pro-social things on there, but there were moderators that would say, you know, you can't say that. Um, and it sounds like once maybe people realize like there's a, there's a sizable number of individuals experiencing this, there might be markets for less censored um, discussion of these issues um, and I don't know if they were designed necessarily to not allow women but I can't imagine if there are if there were such forums and they were saying some very hostile things toward women that they would feel very welcome there to post about their experiences mm-hmm. um, so whether that was kind of a feature or a bug I don't know but that's effectively kind of what happened but there seems to be, as you said, some people, like the person maybe who started it was just, I want to talk to somebody who might have similar problems. And then it's gone to this extreme of people that blame women and then, you know, post um, uh, videos of women being killed and tortured and suffocated and all sorts, you know, really extreme um, videos and things. And and then having this sort of fear almost of you know what they've espoused as fear of I can't be in a room on my own with a woman because she'll accuse me of raping her or touching her or you know this sort of mistrust of women and and hatred of women it seems to go sort of very extreme from you know it's quite difficult to get in a relationship discussions um it's very extreme as it's become seems to have come very extreme yeah and again it's tough to know how many fully how many of the incels actually have those hostile of attitudes? Um, and we we really, we just don't know. Um, and I'm, my suspicion is that some of the more extreme uh, incels probably aren't very willing to engage uh, with researchers. I know there's been issues when I've tried to recruit uh, certain individuals saying that they should be, um, like encouraging others not to participate um, because they, some individuals view, do, view researchers as the enemy um, and representing, um, you know, uh, an ideology or a movement that they feel is um, harmful to them. So, yeah, it, it's really tough to know. Um, and I can imagine for those more extreme individuals, it's going to be a tough road back if they took like from incel them, if you have and hold those suspicious of beliefs. But on one of the programs, they had a man who had these beliefs and didn't go anywhere. So the interviewer sort of got him to go and sit outside a pub at a table outside a pub. And they were just chatting. And then there was some female sitting at the next table. So the interviewer said, oh, do you mind coming and sit and talking to us? And she sat and talked and he was explaining his views. And she was saying, well, women feel like that as well. Yeah, no, I feel the same. I haven't got a relationship. And she was sort of and he seemed to very quickly crumble and say, oh, well, OK, well, maybe I'm wrong then and just carry on with my life. And as if he was going to just stop being an incel because she'd sort of said almost that he didn't realise that women could feel the same way. So it seems, and, and a couple of them were given just other examples. And we know 
um, you know, we hold beliefs and then somebody gives us a, a different example that might disavow us of that belief. You sort of t usually take a while to, oh, actually, yeah, I never thought of that, and then do something different. But a couple of them just seem to think, oh, well, that's fine, then I'll stop, I'll stop doing this and I'll go and, go and have a relationship. It was sort of, whether it was done like that for the programmes, I don't know, but they seemed to be very easily swayed back, which made me think they were swayed in the first place online by having somebody almost brainwashing them with the different views they were seeing. Yeah, well, and I mean, these forums, whether it's it's incel or, you know, one of your favorite sports team, I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're effectively echo chambers, right? A lot of them aren't really set up for, you know, a, a, a good debate of these issues. Um, and some of the incels did tell me that they, they do go to specialty uh, subreddits that, that offer a more balanced perspective uh, on some of these issues, and they find that really helpful. Um, but yeah, and I, I think, you know, you, you you look at some of the numbers and say a lot of incels, they don't have uh, friends or very many friends. Um, so if you don't have that, you don't get many experiences to challenge your beliefs. Um, so, you know, and I think that that particular incel and in that Channel 4 documentary said, you know, like basically the only thing he knows about women is stuff that he's read on the incel forum. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how can you necessarily blame him for believing some of those things when that's effectively all he's been told and hasn't even had, you know, uh, much in the way of interaction uh, with women in general. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I, I should note that not all incels are that you know, reclused and they're not necessarily hermits. Uh, some do, you know, have interactions with women. They might be brief, uh, you know, with the coworker or something like that. But um, yeah, if there's no one around to really challenge those narratives, um, again, you know, the, this kind of stuff can happen. I wonder, I was wondering how many and not that we would know the answer it's more just a wondering about how much of the prison population who would identify as an incel and whether in time um there would be a need for a more targeted intervention for people who identify as incels rather than non-incels non-incel people who have committed an offense against a woman yeah well i suppose uh if you're like a heterosexual male and in a who is incarcerated um you're probably involuntarily celibate in that, at least in that moment. And it kind of gets, I guess, into this idea of like a, a state versus trait um, debate over, over what you are exactly. Um, you know, I was surprised at the Division of Forensic Psychology Conference, how many uh, forensic practitioners were really interested in, and indicated they, they have uh, in cell clients on their on their workload, um, that's not really something that I anticipated, um, because so if you go on to commit any acts of violence or anything that would really bring them to the attention of authorities, um, you know, for for some of them maybe the the whole incel thing is just kind of supplemental to some other issues that are going on, behavioral issues or mental health issues. Um, and that's maybe contributing, but isn't really necessarily the, the main driver. But again, that's, it's super hard to know. Um, and, you know, again, getting back to some of the content that's posted on these forums, um, you know, a number of the, the researchers that have looked at it have basically said, you know, there's, I don't know, like on incels.co now, there's about 14 or 15,000 members, but it's something like 50 people are generating like 25% of the content or something like that. So there are some very, very, very like avid users that are really driving a lot of, of what might be getting picked up. Um, and I, in, in that documentary, um, you know, he mentioned like there, there's sometimes competitions of like, who can be like the, the biggest or the best incel or something like that. So 
you don't necessarily know the motives or the context in which some of this is happening. Uh, some do it to kind of shit post. Some may do it again to to kind of raise their social capital within the incel community, um, but may not have any actual intention of you know carrying out violence or or anything like that. Um, again, obviously not good to be exposed to, um, but how serious some of it is 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 really tough to say. Mm, that's really interesting. So it's almost a way of boosting how important they are, their self-esteem by being the best one in the, or posting the most extreme. And I guess once one person does that, the next person has to go a, a step further. That's really interesting. And have you found any links between, because um, you, you study sexual offending, healthy relationships and incels, have, are there any link, links between them? It's tough. Um, I did a, a review of the incel research um, for, for an article that's in current psychiatry reports. And one of the things the editors asked after kind of the first round of, of review was, can you tie in some sexual violence literature that could maybe explain or some sexual violence theories that could explain um, why some incels do go on to commit violence? And so I found a, a great model of uh, like general sexual aggression. And I found another one uh, that looked at lone wolf terrorism and some of the risk factors um, for both. And I'm reading through it and, you know, they've got like I don't know, seven or eight or nine domains that they think are, are quite concerning. And you start going, well, incels meet a lot of these criteria, like, you know, seven or eight of nine, you know, as a, as, an, as a collective on average. So, you know, you couldn't, I'm sure those are very useful models for working with the general population. Um, but you look at that and you say, well, if a lot of incels would, would meet some of these criteria and a big chunk of them are not going out committing offenses, mm -hmm. um, we're gonna need something else to kind of differentiate those that are at risk. Um, because yeah, like a, a lot of them don't have some of the, or, or they might be lacking some of those protective factors or something like that. Um, and again, it kind of, it makes you re reflect back, and you're like, you know, like this is, this has got to be really tough for them. You know, a lot of them really don't want to cause harm to anybody. They just, you know, if you want to take like a good lives model approach or something, uh, and, and they're pretty explicit about it. They just want to be happy. They just want to go and have what most other people have, um, or at least what most other people have experienced. Um, and you, you start seeing all these signs and I mean, how can you not, you know, feel a bit of empathy for it? Um, so that's interesting. So you weren't necessarily linking those things together, but the reviewers asked you, because I mean, in the sex offender, the sexual offending literature, having hostile views towards women would be a risk factor. But um, then the people wouldn't necessarily be involuntary celibate at the same time. They just hold those views and are going around having relationships. So that's interesting. So they've almost sort of encouraged, the reviewers almost encourage you to link the things together that you wouldn't necessarily have linked together. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, to to their, I don't know, and their defense or their credit, they weren't sure, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I wouldn't have necessarily known either until looking at it saying, well, yeah. Um, but I mean, you look at something like sexual violence, uh, right? The, the bulk of that is done within either an intimate partner setting or um, with acquaintances, people you know. Mm -hmm. Insults aren't really getting out and meeting a lot of people, so they're probably... Uh, one of the a lower risk group um, mm. compared to others just by virtue of circumstance, mm. right? Their, their rates of intimate partner violence are probably very low because they're not engaging in intimate, mm. uh, in intimate partnerships. And it's going to be a stranger <laughs> if it happens. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah, you get the, the kind of the headline attacks, you know, with Elliot Roger and, mm. you know, even in his manifesto he talks about like he just like splash coffee on someone or something because they didn't mm. smile at him or you know kind of strange things and concerning things that probably aren't going to make the news if it happens within the confines of a 
of a romantic relationship because those are unfortunately when it comes to I guess to more violence not necessarily with coffee those are everyday experiences for some people or at least as a society those are everyday experiences mm. well, I was thinking um hopefully you're going to come to Belfast to our um conference this year the DFP conference this year in November and uh update your research then and um present your research what you found since then because it, so it was fascinating and I know I was hosting another session or chairing another session so I couldn't come to it but when people were coming out you could just hear people talking about how interested it had been and and again I think how a lot of people hadn't thought about it so I'm interested that you've had people come and talk to you and saying oh yeah we've got people in this client group because I mean I've been in working in prisons for about 24 years I've never heard I've worked with people who've would espouse having you know hostile beliefs to women but not not being incels or knowing that term so it's, it's interesting that there was people there who were aware that they've got those clients on their books as it were yeah I was quite surprised because clearly that would require some sort of self um yeah. disclosure yeah. uh that they were incels and Again, like, you know, some of the incels, even that go to therapy, may not necessarily come right out and say it. Mm. Uh, there might be, maybe, you know, maybe the therapist suspects this. Um, but yeah, they may not necessarily disclose that because why potentially bias someone against you? Mm. Or maybe never even heard the term, so they wouldn't think to use it. Yeah, or they would just kind of, immediately start thinking, do we need to do a, like a violence risk assessment on this person um, and focus more on that when maybe that's not exactly um, the kind of stuff they need. Um, and, you know, I know that, you know, in, in the risk assessment literature, um, you know, you generally don't focus on things like mental health. Um, you're focused on other kind of criminogenic needs. I mean, you might be treating, um, mental health concerns, but it's usually, you know, it's not like part of the central aid or anything like that. But incels have told me that they feel most vulnerable to reading some of those more nasty posts when they're feeling most depressed, when they're feeling most helpless. So mm -hmm. if you can help people manage those, it might prevent uh, individuals from finding those kind of things more appealing or as offering some sort of relief from whatever it is they're experiencing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th there's certainly a lot to unpack from a, from a clinical perspective about what some of these individuals uh, are, are bringing to the table and some of the issues that that they've got. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense because, you know, anxiety and depression and things could be linked to risk factors of, of, of offending generally or taking drugs or alcohol or anything to them, you know, which could then load inhibition. So you can see why they would be part of that path really towards offending um but that's it was interesting what you say though that they're less likely to hurt other people and also um you know that whether the, the people in prison would consider themselves in that group even though they are involuntarily so but they wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as incels yeah. it's it's a very heterogeneous group um and just in the handful of individuals that i've you know had had the opportunity to to meet with and talk to again you get you get an array of different kinds of people um which and you know it, it's making kind of the the ongoing analysis as i'm going um interesting because it's always kind of changing a little bit um and you don't always know yeah what you're going to get um you know i think that you know, a, a lot of them just, again, want to live a, a meaningful life that they, you know, feel like they have some purpose. Um, again, the basic kind of needs that uh, a lot of us want. Um, and they just haven't, for whatever reason, been able to achieve some of those things. A lot of them direct that frustration inward. Some of them also direct it outward, but the majority do definitely direct it uh, inward and feel that there is something inherently wrong with with them and kind of carry that baggage through their life and basically in, in all sorts of different interactions.
um, they're they're carrying that that weight. It just remains for us to say, let's talk forensic psychology. 